Well, good morning, everybody. If you're visiting here today, again, I want to say a big warm welcome to you. If you've been here for a time or two, man, I'm so glad that you put up with me every, almost every Sunday. Uh, thankful for what God's doing in our church and, and through our ministries and our lives. Thank you for taking a shot on me. I, I recognize picking a church home, being part of a church body, is, a, is an intentional decision. It's this incredible thing that, that was established by, by the Lord that is, is, it, it de- really defies all, all explanation and belief that we would come here voluntarily every Sunday to be offended and forgive each other week after week after week after week. What a beautiful thing it is. Um, you believe it's beautiful? I believe it's beautiful. But we're so thankful that you guys are here. And uh, continuing with our message called Death to Life, uh, the Lord's been really dealing with me today. I got, got up early this morning, came down to the church. I'm hearing his voice, and I'm, and I'm like, Lord, just be quiet. I got, I got stuff to do. And he's like, no, I want you to listen to my voice. And I'm like, but I've already got things planned. And he's like, no, but listen to what I have to say. So I'm in a little bit of that wrestling match this morning. I feel him really close. And I believe that the remarks of our message today are going to strike a, a, a really good chord in our church. I believe last Sunday began a very pivotal moment for this, this congregation and this fellowship. And this Death to Life series really has been a year in the making. And just some Holy Ghost discernment and observations that the Lord's given me about not the, just the American church, but this particular body of believers. And I believe it's pivotal. And so I'm going to ask you, uh, even more than normal, maybe lean in, uh, ask, and not even just lean into what I'm saying, but lean into what the Lord is saying through me. And you guys do recognize there's a difference. There's a difference. Sometimes we can get up here as, as preachers and just say things. And uh, the things that I say, I pray every Sunday as I leave, would just fall on flat and deaf ears. Uh, but the things that he says would go to that place in your life and your heart that makes you uncomfortable in a godly way. And so this morning, we're thankful that we're going to be listening and leaning into his voice. Um, so Heavenly Father, I need your help today. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody says... Amen. I've been hearing the word convergence. Um, prophetically speaking, um, convergence is something that we've got to wrap our minds around. Uh, I saw a picture this morning as I was praying for our church in this moment of almost like five separate lines, almost in a way like you would see frequency in a, in a heart rate monitor at a hospital and how you would see the ups and downs. And I saw these five points um, of frequencies or lines never touching until the end And the Holy Spirit said, you know, Jay, we're living in a time of great convergence. Uh, Let me give you an example of that. Represented in our church are five, possibly six generations of believers. So what does that mean, practically speaking? There's a generation of people that have never heard of a person by the name of Dallas Holmes. Can you believe that? There are young people that have never heard of Dallas Holmes. There are young people that have never heard of Jimmy Swagger. There are there. There are people that have never heard of Love Song. Can you believe that? There are people that have never, you're like, me, I'm one of them. How many have ever heard the, word, uh, the, the band name The Imperials? All right, we got some Imperials fans in here. Um, any Amy Grant fans? All right, there, there's, the, there's the large age group that's represented here. So the Stephen Curtis Chapmans and the Brian Duncans of the world. All right, come on, somebody. Silky, silky smooth voice of Brian Duncan. Come on, somebody. Uh, Russ Taff, any Russ Taff lo- lovers? There we go, all right. Mercy Me, Casting Crowns, Third Day. All right, there, there's the rest of them, all right. I remember one of the most intimate worship moments that I've ever had, uh, it was the first time I ever heard this band, was Hillsong, Shout to the Lord. That's probably, there we go, all right. There's the rowdy ones. All right, come on, somebody. Um, you know, let me go further. Has anyone ever heard of uh, Toby Mack or Chris Tomlin? Or, or, all right. Jimmy Needham. Am I going too deep in the room? Jimmy Needham's good. Need to breathe. Need to breathe pretty good. All right. Uh, how about Maverick City or Elevation Worship? All right. It's amazing to me how you hear just in, in a room by an example, five if possibly six generations of, of believers converging on a point and having five or six different ways to acknowledge how God has moved in the past. But how many know just because God has moved a certain way yesterday doesn't mean that he's going to move that way today. And so we have an obligation and an opportunity that's set before us at Parkway. Parkway is a legacy kind of church. 
when you have, it, it's, it's hard enough to get one generation agreeing and believing on one thing. But when you have five or six generations represented in a room, and that's not even talking about the other things that really matter. Uh, we just talked about stylistically the things and the generations that we were raised in. But there is a convergence point. And I, I don't know necessarily what this all means, but I know that the way forward, I believe, is our heart cannot be a heart about what's about me. Our heart has to be what's about him. And when our eyes go upward onto him, there is, God is going to do something so new and so fresh that I don't believe is going to exclude a generation but it's going to combine generations' wisdoms and, and abilities and, and discernment into a way where we're going to see a move of God like we have never seen before. That's what, that's what, that's what God's preparing us for. And so you have, to, you have to know what God is doing in our hearts and our lives to know that it's probably, it's been a long time since it's been done. Let me give you an example of convergence. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5 says that, um, let, let me read it so I don't, I don't mess it up. Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Thessalonians 1 and 5 describes a convergence point. That there are a lot of people that say, the word, 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 and the word is important. And then there's a lot of people that say, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, and the spirit is important. And in the body of Christ, it is not an either or, it's an and in both. And it is at the place of convergence, I want you to listen to me, it's at the place of convergence where revivals happen. Where my preference or, or my comfortability gives way to what God wants to do. It's the tension, it's the beautiful tension. And so we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about the, the thing that actually keeps this convergence together today in our second installment of what we're entitling Death to Life. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 14, reads this. For this message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, verses 12, who was one of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's was righteous. Verse number 13, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you, because we know that we have passed out of death into life, because why? We love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death, and everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The second passage of Scripture I want to focus on today is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, and it reads... Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, is that you will love your neighbor as yourself and there is no commandment greater than these. When asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus could have responded with any of the most four common words known at the time describing the love that we are supposed to possess. Our language knows only one word for love, whereas there are four types of love in the Greek, philea, eros, storge, and agape. Jesus, when responding and translating the Hebrew word from the Old Testament to the common language at that time, was very specific in the type of love that we're supposed to have as believers. He chose. I didn't choose it. He chose it, the word agape. Let me give you a quick summary for those that are maybe new to this kind of thinking or understanding of the word love. Eros defines an emotional or sexual love. Storgy describes a family love or the love that parents feel, feel for their children. Philea describes a brotherly love. An example of that would be David and Jonathan. But then there's an agape love. An agape love can only be described as an unconditional love. 1 Corinthians 13 describes it painful for our flesh, doesn't it? Known as a love chapter, its sequencing is incredibly impeccable. Sandwiched in between chapters 12 and 14, or the two densest chapters on how to use the giftings given by the Spirit, 13, a chapter on the agape love, is put into Scripture. Because without an agape love, the church will not just fail, it will cease to be the church. 
You can do a lot of things, but if you don't have or are the love of God, the things that you do will not stand up the test of time. It's amazing that we have the giftings in 12 and 14, but the meat of the church is the agape love of God. The most important things that we obtain from the Spirit of God aren't the gifts of the Spirit, but they're really the fruit of the Spirit. To be clear, though, we don't have to choose one over the other. It's not an either or, or, but a both and and. And I believe fullness requires character that's founded upon the fruits and abilities, but founded in the Spirit. And the greatest of those fruit is love. Let me give you the list here for those of you that are maybe new to the faith. Galatians 5, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. Fruit is the natural byproduct of a healthy rooted tree or plant growing what is intended it to grow. Do you know that you will never fool the seed that's in your life? If you have a lemon seed planted in your garden, you can wake up every day and go apple, 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 apple. But you know what's going to happen? Lemons are going to show up. Because you will never fool the seed. Now you can take that lemon, paint it a granny apple green or uh, green color, and you might be able to disguise it from the outside. But when someone takes a bite, you know what's going to happen? Their face is going to be soured as though they just ate a lemon. You are never going to fool the seed. The truth is, is if you are in him, you will see them. Nine fruits that will revolutionize your world, the greatest of which is love. And I just want to stop here and just, just for your understanding note that there are nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. And there are actually nine spiritual giftings that are listed in 1 Corinthians. I don't think it's by, by accident that we are in charge, in charge of or commanded to as believers not just to possess the things that make us look good or make God look good or move the church forward, the nine, but we are also charged to be good with the fruits of the Spirit in the nine. That there is a fullness. There is a fullness that we are supposed to walk in. So pastor, describe this agape love a little bit for me so that I can walk as a full believer. Agape love is a love that God has for us and the love that he asks us to show him and other people. This means that we love a person despite his or her flaws or shortcomings. Agape love is about giving to others, sacrificing our time, energy, and resources for someone else without expecting anything in return. In other words, it is not a conditions-based love. Conditions-based goes something like this. You meet my need, and then I will meet your need. That is not the agape love that's founded in Scripture that we are to have as believers. I believe that agape love is a all-go-first kind of love and expect-nothing-in-return kind of love. It's an unconditional love based upon nothing in return. I am choosing to love you. It really, at its core, is an invitation for relationship. The author C.S. Lewis he gave two observations on agape love. One of which is he said this, love is something more stern and splendid than mere kindness. The second observation that he made about this agape love is you have not chosen one another, but God has chosen you for one another. I want you to lock in with me as we go a little bit deeper this morning. I want you to look around the room. I want you to notice the people that you naturally like, the people that you naturally are at odds with. I want you to look around the room without giving dirty looks and smile at people and go, pastor's asking me to do this awkwardly. Because I want you to know for this season, space, and time, God has chosen us to be together. We didn't choose this, he chose it. To love unconditionally the kingdom of God into us and those around us. The people that are sitting next to you, the people that are your str the strangers, the neighbors, the enemies. The Bible says that you will never find a category of person that will give you a permission not to love somebody. Let me go a step further. Truth is, you will never look into the eyes of someone that God doesn't love. Let me explain this a little bit deeper. There is nothing that you can do that stops God from loving you 
Because there was nothing, there wasn't anything that you did to make him begin loving you. What a love. A love that wasn't based upon preconditions or predispositions, but a love that he chose to love you. And, and listen to me, you were loved, period. You were to love, period. Even the sinner, even the false, even the hated, even the heretic, even the person that has wronged you. It means that we are to love. This extravagant kind of love that has been extended to us is now as believers being asked to be extended through us. Loving people first without expectation is a God kind of love. Listen to what 1 John 4 and 19 says. We love because why? He first loved us. Jesus uses this word agape to describe the kind of love that the church was going to have to have for the mission field it was, it was going to be reaching. You've heard me say it once, you'll hear me say it a thousand times, there are no such things as enemies, only mission fields. It's the reason why on Mission Sunday we brought up 10 missionaries, some of which are going into areas where if they found out what they were doing, they would be martyred and killed and persecuted but the agape kind of love that is inside believers says, I'll go anyways. So if, if we recognize in missionaries going to foreign lands the sacrifice that they're going to make, how about believers in America start with the person that's sitting in the pew next to us? Or the coworker that's down the hallway in the cubicle? Or the person who maybe has wronged us that needs forgiveness? Because why? There is an agape kind of love that is supposed to be found in a church, and it's a step-first kind of love. I am not going to wait for someone to shake my hand in the pew. I'm going to go step and shake someone's hand. I'm not going to wait to be noticed. I'm going to go notice. I'm not going to wait for someone to make things right with me. I'm going to go make things right with somebody else. This agape love is at the core of your Christian walk, and the Bible says that if you do not possess this love, the love of the Father is not in you. What an incredible statement there. And so lightly, there are some things in the church that we've got to get right. There are some things that we have to hunker down on and say, Lord, I want to have the agape kind of love that you had for me, and now it's not going to stop with me. It's going to go through me, and it's going to extend to my world. Here's what human love says. Human love says, you hear people say, I have fallen in love. Fallen is something that has happened. You had no control over it. Human love is an emotion. I, I love this, 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 this thought that human love is ready to die for its object, and a week later it's ready to kill the same object that it fell in love with. Welcome to Marriage Counseling 101. In human love, there's always a because. Because I see you as beautiful, I'm drawn to you. Because our hearts beat as one. Because we think alike. There is always a because in human love. But everything that I have said about human love is not true about God's love. God does not fall in love. He chooses to love. God does not feel in love. He chooses to love. God is love. He doesn't have it. He is it. You know that having water and being water are two different things. God does not have a lot of love. God doesn't even have all the love that there is to have. The Bible says that God is love. And the origin of this kind of love for us extends to others, and it's only possible because why? He stepped towards us first. And it shows us that as believers that if he can step to us in our corruption and decay and the muck and the mire, and, and some of us would do us some good here, not to go too deep down this rabbit hole, but if you can remember where he found you and what you did for him to even step towards you, it's that kind of love that now he's asking you to extend to others. It's why, it's why the testimony of a believer is so powerful. It's because it reminds you of where he found you and he loved anyways. It's a step first kind of love. Tommy Barnett says it this way. If you find a need and meet it, and find a hurt and heal it, you'll begin to show the God kind of love that's being described. 1 John 3, 16 through 18 reads this, the other John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, 
but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Verse number 18, dear children, let us not just love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Love, the agape love of God, is something that goes from internalizing to externalizing. If you only say, well, of course that person knows me. If, I, if in my relationship with my wife, if I never affirmed her, told her I loved her, never showed her I loved her, but I just said in my mind I do, but I never showed it, we have a problem. Love without action and truth is not love. You see, the world's love leads people into despair with a false hope and joy. Come on, somebody, beer commercials that show six-pack abs and joy-filled party scenes, but never show the alcoholic stealing love, joy, and peace from their family. Isn't it amazing that the world's kinds of love will end in destruction, but God's kinds of love will, build, will, will be built on stability and surety? Or how about careers that, that acquire houses but are never, ne never able to build homes? Or people that are married on paper but, but divorced in their hearts? What about lifestyles that lead to more and more experimenting but never any peace and surety? There is a way that seems right to man, but the end is destruction, but there is a better way. There is an agape way. There is a love way, the Bible's way of saying that you can have a peace and surety in your life if you will choose to be a person who embodies agape love. There's a love that doesn't cost you your peace when you lay your head on your pillow. There is a surety, there's a foundation that is beautiful, that will allow you to live a God kind of love. So the aged Apostle John, this congregation was saying, I want you to give us something new. I want you to give us something exciting. I want some more bells and whistles. How are we going to grow the church? What's the latest event we're going to do? What's the, what's the next Rise 24? And I am all for great ingenuity and inspiration. I believe the body of Christ should actually be leading the way in, in, in actually pointing the world to new ways of doing new things. I believe that's what the church should be known for. The church should be known for the cutting edge of how we do things and why we do things. I believe that the, that, that the church should be blessed to be a blessing. I, I believe that one day this church is going to be such a house where the, the, even financially we're not going to be worried about us surviving, but it's going to be, we're going to be a conduit to help many churches in America to be able to reach their missions fields. And, and listen, I'm not scared. I'm not scared because I know this church and I know the people that are here. We're not going to have sticky fingers that when God brings the increase, it's not going to be us grabbing for it so that we can do more things for us. Matter of fact, we're probably going to have the exact opposite problem. That when money begins to flow through here and financial resources begins to come in incredible ways, that there is going to become such a spirit of generosity. Why? Because there is an agape love that God doesn't just give you for your own church, but for also other ministries that are around. His warning and example given was found in a reference that, to the relationship with Cain had with Abel. So let me give you some background here. Genesis chapter 4, there's 16 verses that share the story of Cain and Abel. I'm going to read 12 of them for you today. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. The Bible says, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, and they were in the field, and Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Because the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work to the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength, and you shall be a fugitive and a wanderer 
on the earth. Why did John, in talking about love for people, reference this story? It's a good question, isn't it? Why did, why did he reference that? One of the things that I would ask you to do as your pastor is maybe this week go over these 16 verses in Genesis chapter 4, and I want you to go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, why, why is it that when, when you're talking about the greatest command of loving other people, you referenced two brothers getting a fight over an offering one was rejected, one was accepted. Really, it was, it was the, 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 a, a symbol, an example of the love of God supposed to be in display in the house of God that actually turned into murder. It's an incredible set of circumstances. I'm going to give you three. These aren't the only three. These are the three that I've been praying. Cain's life and decisions gives us some practical tools on how we are to love. Here's the first thing. I believe that Cain got his order of priority wrong. And if you really want to love people, you have to put God first. And I want you to hear me. This isn't one of those Sunday school Bible, Bible lessons that's like, of course. I want you to listen to me. There are many people that are in the body of Christ that God has fallen out of first place in your life and you haven't even known it. One of the scariest scriptures that I find in scripture is found in Judges. In the King James Version, it says, Samson wist not knew that the Spirit of God departed from him. You know what it means? It means that he didn't even know. He went to go back underneath his old strength again, and when he went to go underneath his old strength again, it was gone. How, how is it that, that we can be so used to the effects of what happens when God puts, when we put God in first, but when he starts sliding down the list, our flesh is oftentimes the last to notify us. That's why, that's why I believe it's so important for you to understand because the number one marker of you recognizing that you are not where you should be with God or God on your list is, is how you are treating others. It's, it's really the number one sign because they're connected. If I'm having a lack of patience with people, if I'm not loving, if I'm not extending an arm, if I'm always depleted and drained, and, and this is listening to one of the consequences to Cain. Cain, because you've chosen this, you are going to work and you are never going to see the fruits of your effort pay off. How many people never put those two things together? How many times have, have we counseled or we've discipled or we've, we've been in, in, and Lord, I feel like I'm working hard. Lord, I feel like I'm doing all the things that I should do. I'm even bringing some of my offerings to you. And one of the signs that you know, one of the judgments that you, that you will see in your life is that you will have a lot of motion, but you will not have a lot of movement. And those two things are different. I can come and lift up my hands. I can pay my tithes. I can, I can do all the things that make me look the part, but God looks inwardly and says, where am I at on that list? And if, if to know that I am in first place in your life, one of the signs that you're going to know is how you love other people. So God first, not God in process and theory first, but is God really first in my life? I believe Cain's first mistake was to make position more important than priority. I want you to listen to me. Since the beginning, the older has always struggled with the newer. There's nothing new here. Cain, the older brother, struggled with Abel, the newer brother. Cain was first, but that did not mean that his priorities were correct. Arriving first is not the goal. Putting God first is. You see, the farther that you walk on the narrow road, the more you are susceptible to changing position with priority. The aged apostle says, you will know that you have your priorities correct with God by your love for those around you. I believe the conflict arose out of Abel's genuine offering exposing the pretending of the first from Cain. I'm going to give you just a, a kingdom principle, those of you that are maybe new to the faith. Our best is like filthy rags. I don't know if you actually have ever studied what those filthy rags are, and I don't actually feel like it's all the time appropriate to say it behind the pulpit, but those filthy rags are... They, they come from this idea that women on their menstrual cycle, they would use these rags and they would throw them away. That's what's being referenced there. That our best 
Our best that we can ever do is, is looking to God as things that we should probably be throwing away. So our best is, is, is like filthy rags. We cannot earn work, be good enough to have God's approval. But our best is different than our first. Anything that I put before God is an idol, and he needs to be in first position. What, what we say is the sinner's prayer. What we say is coming to Jesus. What we're saying is, Lord, I recognize that your work on that cross, it paves a way for me to have even the ability to put in, in right order what has been in wrong order. And so, Lord, every day, there's going to be times I'm going to fall, I'm going to mess up, but I'm thankful for your grace and mercy that every day I could pick up my cross and follow you. And I want you to remain first in my life. I want him to remain first in my life because if he remains first in my life, I'm going to have a love for my wife that's going to cause her to win. I'm going to have a love for my children that they're not going to run from me, they're going to run to me. I'm going to have a love for my, my family members and my coworkers that they're going to know that something's different about me to have this agape kind of love. I believe that there are so many people that are chasing healthy human relationships only to grasp them like sand on a beach. Listen to me, you will never have the marriage, family, career, church you were intended to have outside of a right relationship with God where he's put in proper priority. One of the lessons of my life that I've learned over the last 20 months is how many times that I, I have even put the good over God. That's dangerous. How many times I have a love for my family. I have a love for my, my, my parents, my pastors. I have, a, I have a love that oftentimes I would go to them before, that I, before I would go to the Holy Spirit. It's out of balance. What? What, what kept me at a church for so long, for 21 years, before I would say, okay, Lord, the Lord had to make it so uncomfortable for me that I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to go. And I remember that, that Sunday, it was like an audible voice came down, sitting on the front row, tapped me on the shoulder and said, son, it's time. Sometimes putting things in proper order even means, even means putting your family at the second position where God's supposed to be first. I know it sounds counterintuitive. It's, 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 it's Abraham. Abraham, I need, I need your son. Okay, Ishmael? No, a Abraham, not that son. I need the one that you love. Well, I love both of them. No, no, no. Abraham, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't, don't we do that? God comes knocking at the door at church, and, and he begins to point things out in our life, and, 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 and he begins to convict about the way that we've loved or haven't forgiven, and what we do is we try to offer compromise to God. It's what Cain, Cain, Cain was basically saying, okay, Lord, I'm not going to give you my first. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you sort of my best, but it's not going to be really my best. And God called him on the carpet, and he said, he said listen, listen, son, Cain, Cain, listen, listen. If you do this, that which is contrary to you is very close to taking you out. You even see the mercy and grace of God in Genesis chapter 4 in the Old Testament because God probably had the right to say, Cain, no, this isn't, this isn't right. But what did he do? He gave Cain an opportunity. Cain, you continue down this road. There is going to be relational dysfunction that's in your life for a long time. The first thing that I've learned as I've been praying about this message for you today is you got to put God first. God first. I was I was counseling with a, a pastor friend when I first moved here. And, and I, said, I said this phrase like I've always said for 20 years. And I said, you know, family first, pastor. And he paused and he goes, do you really believe that? I go, of course, family first. You've got to prioritize your family. And he goes, no, but listen to what you're saying. Like, do you, do you really believe that? Like, like family in first position of your life. And I pause and I go, well, yeah, I don't really believe that. I believe it's God first in my life, that if I seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto me. That, that if my wife is ever going to have the best husband that she can have is not when I put her in first position, it's when I put God in first position. And so you have to be careful that you're not going through the motions and doing what I've done, which is you just, you, 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 God and good. Even the things that God produces, sometimes we can put in front of God. But it's got to make sure that we put God first. The second thing that I learned or just felt like I was supposed to share with you out of this passage of Scripture is that you are to be an able foundation. Cain had a heart 
that when he got corrected, it was a what about me heart. Do you know a lot of times offense happens in people's lives because they feel overlooked and shunned? And there's this heart that comes to them that says, well, what about me? so and so's getting elevated and so and so has friends and so on and comparison is a thief of relationship we all do it don't you act like you don't, don't we all do it well so and so does this and so and so does that and so and so does this. comparison is a thief of relationship and what Cain his biggest mistake that he made was instead of looking to Abel and saying i need to follow my younger brother and his example he began to, to get, what about me? And then when God went to correct him, well, was what about me? Cain or Abel made me look bad. And at the end of the road of isolation and a what about me attitude, listen to me, ends where relationships get destroyed. So I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you with everything that's in me as your pastor to begin to remember your first love. Remember, remember that agape love that was shown to you when you were born again as a believer and now you have an opportunity as a believer in Jesus to begin to show that agape love to the world around you. And let us start the church. Asilla says this, no man is a complete failure until he begins disliking men who succeed. I believe that we are to be the foundation by which others launch into God's success upon. There are many a pastor that have ruined a move of God because they're jealous of another believer's giftings. And I'm telling you that as a pastor. I'm telling you that as a pastor, you better be careful when you're leading a congregation that when God begins to equip and train people up in, in unique and special and awesome ways, that I don't take offense at what God's doing in other people. Because why? It is not my job to be someone's ceiling. It's my job to be someone's floor. That I, I, my life needs to be a trampoline by which other people can jump off of and do greater things than I've ever done. We are to be the foundation by which others launch into God's success. Don't be, don't be Cain. Avoid envy at all costs. I want you to listen to me. James chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, as my wife comes back to the keyboard this morning. Listen to what it says. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion. And what does it say? Every evil work. If, if you want to assure your relationship at your church and with your church body or your body of believers in Grant's pastor, Josephine County, if you want to assure that every evil work is present, walk in envy and strife. Walk in jealousies. Walk, walk in murmuring and complaining. If, if you want to open the door to a bunch of dysfunction, have envy and strife in your life. But I like that the Lord doesn't just stop there. What does he say? He says, but the wisdom that is from above is what? Pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Don't just run from envy, jealousy, and the like. But this pastor's encouragement to you on the first Sunday of October is run to the wisdom of God. Run to purity. Be peaceable. Be gentle. Be full of mercy and good fruits for everyone. And do so undivided. P.L. Tan says this, The man who keeps busy helping the man below him won't have any time to envy the man above him. And there may not be anybody above him anyway. Romans 13, 13 through 14, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife or envy, envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 talks about our conduct being honoring of God. This pastor, I want you to know something this morning. There is nothing like seeing people win for Jesus. Nothing like it. There's nothing like when you see a young man like Marcos get spontaneously baptized and you hear the story. I was getting ready to end it all. 
and I was walking out of this church through that green exit sign and through that other door were people that began to love me. Isn't it amazing what God does? That the greatest thing that happens in a church is not what happens behind a pulpit or a keyboard. That you're in ministry right now as you're sitting in this sanctuary. And if you will just learn that you have the power, the power and authority to love people from a place of despair and loss to a place of winning and victory, if you will just choose to love people in their mess. The church is guilty. Why don't you, be, why don't you listen to me? The church is guilty that the moment anything bad happens in a church, well, this is what we do. Hope someone helps them. The moment that someone makes a poor decision, oh. But the agape kind of love that happens in the body of Christ is when the Bible says that when someone falls down, that there will be another there to pick them back up. Aren't you thankful that you were picked back up a time or two in your Christian walk? Yeah, give the Lord a big round of applause this morning. Hallelujah. Man, there is nothing like seeing people win for Jesus. My son started in our youth group. My youngest, Jace, who's in middle school class. And came home one Wednesday night and they were going to have the, the junior high event. And he said, I went to Pastor Kylie and I just, I told her I needed some flyers because I wanted to invite everybody at my school. Everybody at my school. And dad in his wisdom was trying to guard him from missed expectations because I didn't want him to invite his whole class and no one show up. Oh, ye of little faith, dad. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that those of us that have walked longer when kids show us the way to have childlike faith. My son, oldest, he was seven or eight years old walking through a grocery store and this man had a wheelchair with no legs. Wheelchair had legs or wheels, but the man had no legs. And I heard it, you know when you hear your kids say a question out loud and you wanna run? My wife was faster than me that day. My, my oldest, Jaden, looks at this man and says, what happened to your legs? And my wife, she gone. I mean, she gone. And so I'm like, oh Lord, how am I gonna clean this one up? <laughs> man was so nice. He said, you know, I've got diabetes. And lost my legs and, you know, just, just trying to do the best I can. And, Jaden didn't skip a beat and Jaden said, well, my, my grandpa has diabetes and I would pray for him every day. You mind if I pray for you? And so Jaden gets me close and he says, dad, pray. And I start praying, you know, Lord, would you touch, would you touch this man? You know, real, real sincere, powerful prayer. Lord, would you just give him the strength it's going to take to, to get through these next, you know, last years of his life? And Jaden tugs me and he goes, pray for his legs to grow back. Son, son, that's not how that works. Of course it is. It's exactly how that works, Dad. Isn't it funny that the older that you get, you have to guard against cynicism because you've loved in vulnerability and you've been hurt? You've been disappointed? But, but you have a faith as a child. And so I mustered all the great courage that I could have. The courage went something like this, Lord, if you want to grow this man's legs back, that'd be really cool to see. You know, like, I can't tell you there was a whole bunch of faith in it. Um, man started weeping, just weeping under the anointing of God. And my son, at the time, was probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old. We led this man to the Lord in the middle of a Safeway. And this man began to weep, and he said, I haven't seen faith like that in a long time. Is that the most incredible thing? Because... Because why? Listen, 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 listen. The most incredible thing that's going to happen in the last days is in the spirit of offense that's going to rise, like the Bible says, that we will be found as a church that loves each other. 
And that love will push us in action to love a world that's in desperate need of a message of hope and faith. I believe the day is coming. I believe the day is coming when dead people are going to be raised. I believe the day is coming when legs are going to grow back. And I, I, I believe even greater than those two things, the day in the church is going to come back. Would you listen to me? When we actually love each other. Which out of those three is probably hardest? Oh, that we would love each other. Third and last thing, that we would just learn how to take ground, not just tilling the ground. Cain, because of a posture against creating a foundation for others to win, introduced him to a life where his life's fruit didn't match his efforts. If you find yourself spinning your wheels in life, stuck in a rut, let me give you some practical bits of advice this morning. Find yourself someone to serve and love and expect nothing in return. If you're looking for a friend, be a friend. If you're lonely, go be someone else's companion. To give, and the Bible says it will be given unto you, pressed down and running over. I believe the fastest way to the top in the kingdom is serving those who can never repay you for what you do for them. A South African missionary was writing in a journal and the Lord began to, to move through this South African missionary of rewriting 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here's what the South African missionary said. You ready for it? If I have the language perfectly and speak like a native and have not his love for them, I am nothing. If I have diplomas and degrees and know all of the up-to-date methods and have not his touch of understanding love, I am nothing. If I'm able to argue successfully against the religions of the people and make fools of them and have not his wooing love for them, I am nothing. If I have all the faith and great ideals and magnificent plans and not his love that sweats and bleeds and weeps and prays and pleads, I am nothing. If I give my clothes and my money to them and have not his love for them, I am nothing. If I surrender all prospects, leave home and friends, make the sacrifices of a missionary career and turn sour and selfish amid the daily annoyances and slights of missionary life, and have not the love that yields its rights, its leisures, its, its plans, I am nothing. Virtue has ceased to go out of me. If I can heal all manner of sickness and disease, but wound hearts and hurt feelings for want of his love, and that is kind, I am nothing. If I can write articles or publish books that win applause, but fail to, dis to transcribe the word of the cross into the language of his love, I am nothing. If I can heal all manner of sickness and disease, but wound hearts and hurt feelings, I am nothing. Julius Gordon said this, love is not blind, it sees more, not less, but because it sees more, it is willing to see less. For there is a love that the Bible says will cover a multitude of sins. Would you stand up all across your feet? Brooke, would you lead us in a worship song? Hallelujah. Yes, Father. Oh, and hope.
step first kind of love. This is what the response time to this message is going to be about this week. Would you find someone in the church that maybe you haven't connected with in a long time? Would you spend a few moments maybe crossing paths with somebody that there's been some rub with? Would you listen to me? The greatest miracle, those of you who are listening online, the greatest miracle that's going to happen in the last days is not the dead being raised to life. That's going to happen. It's not legs growing back. That's going to happen. It's not eyesight being restored. That's going to happen. It's not deaf ears being opened. It's going to happen. But the greatest miracle that's going to happen in the last days is a church that decides to have the agape love in their life and love people through the mess of their life to the foundation that's found in Jesus. Would you agree with me this morning? Would you stretch up your hands all across this room? Heavenly Father, let it start with me. Has our love grown so cold that even in this message that we even think that he's not talking about me? God, I don't want my love to grow cold. Father, these are wonderful people. And thank you this morning for reminding us of the church and the believer that we're called to be. I'm thankful that this morning I was allowed to show them what you see when you see them. Agents of incredible change in Josephine County. That in a world where it's politically divided, in a world where there's so, so much chaos and turmoil, in a world where relationships are fracturing like never before, when homes are a mess, when the, when the home has been attacked by every kind of evil doctrine that's in this world, Father, I thank you that these people at this church have an agape kind of love, a love that is sure and steadfast, one where it brings hope to a world that is desperately hopeless. Lord, let it start with me, this pastor. Would you put your hand over your heart, your right hand over your heart, and say, Lord, let it start with me. Let it start with me, Lord. Hey, this morning, if, if you're not right with God, you know, I want you to know that we're here for you. He's just a step away. You know, when you hear that phrase in church, you know, we're believing for a move of God. Here's what the truth is. God's already moved. He already made his move. Really what a move of God is, is a move of man towards God. What revival is, is not God wanting to move. It's the people realizing they didn't, how far they've gotten. And wow, like a prodigal son. I was talking to someone this week in the office and I said, you know, you can take a million steps away from God, but it only takes one step to get back. Is that not the grace and mercy of God? It's an incredible thing. This pastor, man, do I love you. Man, do we want to see people win. But Lord, let us be Holy Ghost love uh, dealers, man. Hope dealers, not dope dealers, right? Let's go, let's go win a whole bunch of people for Jesus this week. Father, a prayer of blessing over our people, protection, favor, and Father, let us do someone something for someone this week that can never repay us. Father, an agape kind of love through us and in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, just a reminder, we have our membership meeting. It's down the hallway in the fellowship hall. Uh, if you're not a member and you would like to come and check it out, you're more than welcome to. If not, go 49ers. God bless you guys. It's the power. It's